All right, let's get started. We are back for Brian's uh, second lecture, which is entitled Part Two. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so plan for today is we'll I'll quickly recap, then we'll talk about um, geometry and entanglement. Uh, Jeff has already set this up very nicely this morning, so I don't have to do very much. Um, and then we'll proceed to the main topic, which is discussing the holographic proposals for complexity. And we'll try to just explain what they actually are as proposals, and then also talk about what they might be equal to. It'll be an equation with a very well-defined left-hand side and a not very well-defined right-hand side. Um, unlike Entanglement, we can't yet give a derivation that explains, you know, we, we don't even know what the right-hand side should be, much less can prove that there's an equal sign. But nevertheless, the proposal is inspiring and passes many checks, and so people have spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I'll sort of end with some examples and a discussion of what we'll do the last time on Friday. Okay, so let's just recap quickly. Um, I started out with this motivation that if you look at the geometry of a black hole interior, this is a fairly general statement, but I discussed it in the context of ADS-CFT, um, that it, it looks like a tube that's um, growing with time. So there's some kind of outside part, which is the ADS-like geometry, and then there's an inside part where you have a tube that's growing with time. And we said that according to um, solution of Einstein equation, this will just go on for a very long time, right? So there's a question of what is the meaning of this? And I said last time that um, the idea that grew out of works of Hartman and Maldacena and also Susskind, especially Susskind, is that this is dual to the growth of complexity of some suitably defined type. Okay, so that's the, that's the overall motivation, and, and we'll actually see sort of a precise version of this later today. And then last time we talked about uh, qubits and circuits. So just so you have something very concrete in your head, I gave you a very precise definition of complexity um, in which you could prove an upper bound on the complexity for any state, and then we had various algorithms and examples where you had lower bounds or at least estimates for what the complexity should be. And so we had some examples which included ground states and uh, time evolution. And I want to just emphasize two points. First of all is that I gave you a very precise model, but we sort of saw that the model doesn't matter too much for a lot of basic questions. So for example, you can switch the gate set or add tolerance in various ways, and the basic structure doesn't care too much about that. So going forward, we're going to be pretty liberal about what our basic underlying computational model is. Of course, I'll try to give you a bunch of different examples, but we don't have to stick to that one particular setting. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that although entangle, although complexity is extremely hard to calculate, basically there's no algorithm to tell you what it is apart from simply searching over every possible circuit and seeing which one has the smallest length, it is something we care deeply about. If you can tell me a better way to prepare ground states of some quantum system, I would really like to know that. If there's some way to do time evolution more efficiently than these naive algorithms that I discussed last time, we'd really like to know that. That would be extremely useful information. Okay. So we very much care about how complex these things are, even if we can't decide for sure this is the minimum possible circuit. Getting a smaller circuit is always interesting. Okay. So let's talk about um, black holes. So um, as we saw this morning and um, in other lectures, black holes, first of all, 
have an entropy when you turn on quantum effects. Of course, we don't know how black holes work at the quantum level in our own universe. We haven't done that experiment yet. But the fact that they have entropy is a fairly generic statement based on relatively robust properties of a large class of systems, of theories. So we're going to take this as a, as a starting point. And it's certainly true in ADS-CFT. Is that bothering anybody? All right, I won't worry about it. Um, this entropy is proportional to the area of the horizon over 4G. And we'll often think of this entropy as just the number of qubits involved in the system. Now, technically, the Hilbert space could be infinite dimensional, et cetera. There is a fairly standard way of saying that you can compress the Hilbert space to a finite dimensional system. This is this one-shot stuff that, that Jeff was mentioning. Um, you can actually calculate how much space you need to store all the states to very high precision, you know, sort of one of these small epsilons in, in some nice norm, and it's not much bigger than this. So for many purposes, you can think of this as really a finite dimensional system with a certain number of qubits or degrees of freedom in it. And they, they also process this information. They process the information um, rapidly and chaotically. classical example is if you take a black hole and you ping it, you throw something into it or you hit it somehow, it rapidly rings down and approaches uh, equilibrium configuration again. And in fact, the time scale for that ring down is quite fast when viewed in sort of quantum language. The characteristic time scale is proportional to, well, let me drop all the units, but the time scale is like one over the temperature, which is like beta. And if you put in your h-bars and your um, Boltzmann's constants, then that's some kind of very basic time scale in a hot quantum system. OK. And so this has given rise to uh, the sort of simplest picture you can have is that this black hole is some kind of finite dimensional system that's processing information rapidly. It's probably coupled to the rest of the universe via quantum fields somehow. Um, yeah. The black, I mean, in the, in the case of a Schwarzschild black hole, this time would be about the radius of the black hole. Indeed. Um, it, it doesn't, naively, it doesn't seem that surprising. I feel like I'm missing something in that statement. If I have a system of size R for it to process information on a time scale of the light crossing time, some information doesn't seem shocking. Uh, is there something? more that you can say to make that statement? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, yeah, I agree from the sort of black hole point, from the geometry point of view, it's not super surprising. If you're a quantum minibody theorist like me, then systems where this time scale shows up are relatively rare. So it's a little bit unusual. Very often, like, for example, uh, take a metal, the Time scale for relaxation in metal is much longer than this time scale, typically, like parametrically longer. Um, so you need some kind of special ingredients. I'm not saying it's that special, but it's like a little bit unusual. But but the calculation of the ring down is essentially a classical calculation. That's right. That's How right. do you know that corresponds to a whole lot of quantum information being processed rather than just a few bits? Well, it's a. I mean, I don't say it's a lot of quantum information, but it is information about the perturbation. So it is a two-point function, which is decaying, and... So you're not claiming that this by itself tells you something about scrambling? No, no, I'm not making any kind of super precise statement here. Okay. And th this is a fairly... So, sorry, then I, yeah. I, then I want to complain about the word chaotically in that sentence. Yeah, okay. What would you like to complain? <laughs> well, I don't think it should be in the sentence if, you, if, if it's... I mean, I, I don't know whether we can conclude from the ring down that this is a chaotic process, uh, unless I'm missing some part of the argument. Well, I, I, I'm not trying, I mean, I probably could, but I'm not trying to make a sharp connection, but it is the case that the, the 
typical thing we associate with chaos, the thing you observe normally is relaxation to equilibrium, and that's what's happening here. Now, yeah, okay, I did not prove you a theorem that says relaxation of all two-point functions implies operator growth, but that's the basic picture, right? That, you know, you start with this simple thing, it's spreading out, and here what we're asking for is basically the amplitude that you remain where you started, that's the two-point function. The OTOC is telling you how it's spreading in this bigger space, how the operator's weight is getting more and more complicated, but we expect these things to all be generically present. Okay, other questions? <clears throat> Yeah, and let's say th this we could say, we could try to say generically, but then this is most precise, I would say, in the context of ADS CFT. Okay. And in that context, as already discussed, we have a connection between. geometry and states. So really we have a state-state duality. States of the CFT are equivalent to states of the quantum gravity theory. But for a nice class of states of this quantum gravity theory, we're going to present that as geometry. So this is, gives rise to the often stated where we take this and say, let's keep it this way. This is a semi-classical bulk geometry. Okay. And then geometrical features of that space-time encode in a nice way properties of the quantum state of the dual CFT. And you already saw one of those discussed this morning, which is the entanglement of regions of the CFT. Okay. So, for example, you can just have the vacuum. I'll draw it like this. I'll draw a spatially extended, and then let's say time comes out. So this is like where the CFT lives. Z is some sort of radial or emergent coordinate, right? There's a metric here, which might look like this. This is the Poincaré patch. And uh, what you see, it's some kind of hyperbolic metric where the effective size of spatial interval shrinks as you go into the bulk, right? So this is the CFT, this is the bulk. And this space-time is supposed to be equivalent to the ground state of this CFT. It has the same symmetries, and you can encode correlation functions in interesting ways. You can also, of course, look at entropy of some bulk region, in which case you'd have a surface like that, and this would be your RT surface, right? And the, say, length or area of that surface in Planck units would tell you the entropy of that corresponding region. Now, we also have black holes. I'll talk about actually a black brain, let's say, for simplicity. This means it's extended in space. So I can draw the same picture. And now if I focus on the outside, there's some special point, special line here, ZH, which is the horizon. And this describes the space outside the black hole between the horizon of the black hole and the asymptotic boundary. And now if you look at the entropies, say, of small regions, they still look like the entropies in empty space. So small regions have the same entropy essentially as in the vacuum. But if I now look at a very large region, one candidate, and in fact the correct minimal surface, the RT surface, hangs down kind of close to the horizon, like this, and you see there's kind of an extensive 
contribution that comes from the place where the RT surface hangs along the horizon, and that's telling you that the entropy, according to the Bekenstein-Hawking formula of the black hole, is just encoding the thermal entropy of subsystems of this thing. So that's one version of the system where we're in a thermal state like that. We can also consider this two-sided configuration, where I have one boundary and another boundary, and I have my horizon in the middle. So this is CFT1, CFT2. Let me draw these a little bit closer. It's meant to be symmetrical. Like that. So this is a slice of time reflection symmetry. And I'm looking at space, which connects one asymptotic boundary to another via this spatial bridge or wormhole. Now here's the horizon or the bifurcation surface. And this is supposed to describe now a situation where I have an entangled state between the two CFTs. Right. This is the square root of the Boltzmann factor. And the connectivity between the two is encoding the large amount of entanglement that exists between these two theories. Right. In particular, I can, I can now look at situations where I have, say, a region that includes, includes both theories. Right? And now there's two possible candidates. One candidate surface looks like this, plus the corresponding one here. But there's another candidate where they connect up through the bridge like that. And you can kind of convince yourself that if, if the regions are very, very large, then this vertical one is always going to give you the smaller answer. So it'll be the one which calculates the entropy correctly. And that's saying that these two degrees of freedom here are mostly entangled with each other and less entangled with other degrees of freedom within the system. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so could, could you clarify your last statement? Yeah, so I said that the degrees of freedom of one are mostly entangled with the degrees of freedom of two instead of with other degrees of freedom in one. And what, what's that got to do with the sentence? Well, so let's put it this way. Um, the fact that the surface cuts like, let's say a, a simple picture of what this state is, is it's bell pairs between the top and the bottom. Now that's not quite right because I have some local entanglement within my theory. So what I should really have a picture of is these bell pairs which are then embedded somehow via some isometry or some mapping into a much larger UV Hilbert space, right? The number of bell pairs here is equal to the entropy of the black hole, or let's say the number of bell pairs per unit length or per unit area are equal to the entropy density of the black hole horizon. And then I'm embedding those into this larger microscopic CFD Hilbert space. I don't know if it'll help, but I, I think it might be worth pointing out that the phase transition happens roughly at the thermal length scale. Uh, yeah. I, and so when you're looking at regions that are shorter than that, it's like just being in the vacuum. That's right, yeah. Is 
question in the chat. Uh, for a theory with IR cutoff at Z equals ZH, from where, from where will the RT surface start? Will it start from Z equals ZH instead of Z equals zero? With an IR cutoff. Well, I, it, I would say that it always, if you're not cutting off the UV, it starts, like if you're pushing the UV cutoff in, then it would start from wherever you put the cutoff. If you're cutting off in the infrared by changing the state, then what happens to the RT surface depends on what the state is. I think he means an IR cutoff in the bulk, which could be associated with a UV cutoff on the boundary. I see. In which I case, see, I think I the answer yeah, is yeah, yeah, is yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. So, you know, you need to put some kind of regulator surface here, which is some amount epsilon inside, and that would give you finite entropies. Okay. So here you have s qubits, and then this is some. Um, map into the UV Hilbert space. And then the same map, or some conjugated map. So this is like a sort of simplified circuit picture where you can imagine that what the circuit is is something like the circuit I showed you last time to prepare the ground state, except where you cut off the circuit below some link scale because those degrees of freedom are no longer in their ground state, but actually in an entangled thermal state with this other set of things. Okay. So this kind of reasoning was what people were thinking about and talking about back in the days of entanglement and geometry. Entanglement equals geometry, or entanglement gives birth to geometry, et cetera. But, I mean, it's only part of the story. This was put nicely by, by Susskind at some point where he talked about entanglement not being enough. And let's understand a little bit about what that means. So this was all a time zero picture, and let me draw the space-time version of that picture here. So this is time. This is still something like z, and I'm suppressing x. I have my two horizons here, and this Use green. This green surface here is what I was talking about previously, right? So this whole thing is green, right? So now we can ask what happens is suppose I evolve in time, say on both sides. If you evolve in this kind of counter propagating way, nothing happens. That's a symmetry. As you can see here, if you evolve this forward in time and that backwards in time, because the energies are correlated, nothing actually happens. The phases cancel out. But if you go forward in time on both sides and consider a state up here defined at these two points, then we can ask about what now are the entropies, say, of that state. Right. So let's evolve in time to this point. There's a T right and a T left. This was originally called one and two. So I rotated the diagram. And now the picture, of course, there are lots of formulas you can write down for all this, but I won't uh, bother with that. The picture is kind of drawing from that picture there. It's saying that as time evolves, the two boundaries get further apart. So if we look back at our picture here, if time has passed, then you get something like this. 
Of course, exactly what the picture is depends on what spatial slice you take. But now you're effectively like up here. So let's say you choose some slice which goes through and now it hits this at two places. And that's these two places here, right? So we can call this one or left, two or right. And then these are the places where you hit the, so this is kind of exterior, interior, exterior, right? And now if you ask again, what's the entropy of say this paired region on the two sides? You can first ask what's the entropy of just one region on one side. That's always going to be given by the equilibrium answer because if you trace out one side, you just get back the thermal state and so you have to get the equilibrium answer. But if you look at these two-sided correlations or two-sided entropies, then your RT surfaces can probe the entire geometry or at least some part of it. And so now you have different candidates. Here's one candidate like this. I'm being a little bit sketchy because these candidates don't necessarily live in the same spatial slice, but let me not worry about that. And then you have this kind of other candidate which is now getting longer, right? As time evolves, get longer. Again, technically, these two candidates don't live in the same, like the, the minimal surface here does not live in the same slice as this one but I'm fudging that here just for simplicity. Let's just say there's two classes of solutions. One where you stay ex totally outside and one where you pass through the interior. Right. And you can find this, uh, this interior surface. This was first done by Hartman and Moldesena. Interior of the black hole leads to entropy growth. And so from the fact that this interior geometry is growing linearly, you expect that this part here is growing linearly with time. And so the length of this RT surface is also growing linearly with time. So what this will predict is that the entanglement entropy of regions here will at initially grow with time in some way, provided they're in the phase where they're initially connected. So the entropy will grow with time. It'll keep growing until it reaches some maximum amount set by the thermal entropy of each of them separately. That would be like the equilibrated situation where there's no more entropy to get. And then the RT surface will snap or transition from this connected surface to the interior surface. And so you can kind of see very literally and also very pictorially how the growth of the interior is corresponding to increasingly scrambled state of your system where eventually, no matter how big your region is, the interior is so long that the entropy always prefers to have its equilibrium value and you have a fully equilibrated state even when you're looking at two-sided objects. Um, if I change the Cauchy, the Cauchy slice I've chosen there, does this change in any significant way or? Well, I, again, so there's a, there's a, this, this, this dot d dashed solution here just involves the exterior geometry. You can find it easily enough. It's the same one as here. This one through the interior you, you get by solving for the extremal surface and choosing the minimal one, right? So it lies on some special slice that you can calculate and that's how you get that thing. So this is, I'm just sort of sketching schematically the minimal, the, the one you get by extremizing between um, curves that pass through the interior. Um, thanks, and uh, can this story be translated also to collapsing black holes or has it only been done so far? Oh yeah, it? sure, it can be done in collapsing oh. black holes as well. Okay. This is just a particularly simple uh, setup where I don't need to talk about this initial state. 
yeah. Uh, does it have to do with the slice getting closer to the singularity as can well, this be ascribed to this? Because there, there are other black holes where the interior looks qualitatively really different, as, yeah, you, good. as you know, of course. Good, good question. Um, it actually does not get arbitrarily close to the singularity. There's a special slice. Um, uh, roughly speaking, in the interior here, if I draw, say, a, like, you have these kind of curves that look like this, which are curves of constant r, right, which are like time now. And the time is running this way, and it's time translation invariant in that, like the metric doesn't depend on t. So what you find is that there's a special slice where your extremal surface of this type, which is connecting them, will just lie along that special slice for most of the time and then come back out again. And that slice actually does not get close to the singularity in simple cases. All right, this is, yeah. So it doesn't actually directly probe the singularity. And if you just compute basically the cross-section of that slice as it goes across, that tells you the rate of entropy growth. And that's essentially what Hartman and Maldacena did in their paper. Okay. <clears throat> so, you have this thing, entropy initially grows linearly, but then it eventually saturates. But the interior keeps growing. So the entropy is kind of a catch-all. Once the entropy is saturated, you know it's really completely in equilibrium. There's no simple correlation function that can tell that you're not in just this thermal state. But the interior geometry keeps going. So this led to the, the sort of puzzle or the question, well, what's, what's changing about the state or the system after all the entropies have equilibrated? So every subsystem of any side or any combination of sides looks exactly like what it should be if it was essentially a random state with that entropy. But nevertheless, the geometry keeps growing, right? And if we go back to our picture there, let me, let me do it over here. The simple idea is as follows. What's happening physically? Well, we have this initial state, which is our simple entanglement embedded into the UV space. Oh, question. Is there any reasoning and assumption about the, where the dual CFT lives? Like what kind of space? Is it a, a sphere or something? I was thinking if you have a CFT on flat space, for example, can't you take a large enough regions? Yeah, that's right. If I, have a, if I have a flat space, like truly extended CFT, then it can grow forever. The entropy can grow forever for the largest regions. But for any fixed region, it'll eventually saturate. But yeah, let's say for simplicity, I have a finite number of total degrees of freedom, so I put it ultimately on a very big sphere, and then this statement is true. Eventually, even the largest regions will saturate the entropy. OK, thank you. And just as a comment, you can also see that the saturation time is going to be proportional to the system size. Because here, this part of the curve, which is what you're going to switch to, is extensive in the system size, the subsystem size. And that has to compare with this part of the curve, which is linear in time. And so the time it will take for the equilibrated answer to give you the right answer to be minimal is a time of order the linear size of the subsystem. Okay, so this was the sort of t equals zero picture. What about the t greater than zero picture? It looks like this, or this is one cartoon. Imagine that you have this quantum state, and what you're doing is evolving with the boundary Hamiltonian, right, which is acting on the UV degrees of freedom. 
But most of those degrees of freedom are in their ground state, so they're not changing with time. There's some set of sort of active degrees of freedom down here, some infrared degrees of freedom that are excited and can change with time. And so the simple picture would be that you have some kind of UV evolution which gets mapped effectively into an infrared evolution that's acting on your active degrees of freedom here. Right? So you have all these UV qubits, they're not playing a role, they're mostly in their ground state. There's some set of infrared degrees of freedom, S qubits, and those are the ones that are processing information. And so you have a picture like this, where instead of these simple straight lines, this is the picture that Hartman Maldacena drew, you have uh, You have a smaller number of, you have a large number of UV degrees of freedom. This is the UV, this is the IR, IR, UV. And now what these crosses are meant to indicate is that there's some interaction between these lines. So if you like, you're taking this picture here and you're putting quantum gates that couple these degrees of freedom in a spatially local way and you're stacking more and more gates and that corresponds to a longer wormhole, which is equivalent to stacking or making a conveyor belt of quantum gates. And moreover, these are quantum gates acting on the infrared degrees of freedom, not the UV ones. And so you might hope that that set of infrared activity is something specific to your theory and which doesn't care as much about precisely how you define things in the UV. It's some kind of infrared evolution that you might hope has a universal form or universal characterization. So you take these simple lines and you add gates, which are essentially the UV time evolution passing through this map to give you some effective infrared evolution. And that infrared evolution, as time progresses, just stacks more and more gates on the interior, and so the wormhole gets longer and longer. Okay, so this led to the idea, idea one, length of the wormhole equals depth of circuit, something like that that describes this evolution. This was Linney's first proposal. Um, this is not, it, it captures this physics, but it's not the best for a lot of other purposes and it fails some simple checks. And so this led to idea two, which is called complexity equals volume. And the statement is this, that the complexity of the state is equal to some volume divided by LG. This is the ADS radius. G is a gravitational constant. And V is the volume of some specific spatial slice. In particular, it's the slice with maximum volume. Right? So it's selecting a particular <laughs> one of these. It's similar to the entanglement slice, but slightly different typically. And um, it also doesn't approach the singularity and it just extends through the bulk like that. So the, the, the picture very literally, like you're just kind of counting gates by just asking what's the volume of this region of space. Where what's interesting is that time has been traded for, for length in the interior because this is kind of the direction of T here. And so along the wormhole is like time. And so you're taking this time evolution on the boundary and turning it into kind of, you're laying it out if you like, displaying the history of it, which is now running along this wormhole. And you simply want some way 
to quantify the size of that wormhole, and then you say that this is equal to the complexity. It's just counting how many gates have been laid out between these two boundaries. Hey, Brian. Um, is one reason why he replaced depth of circuit with complexity so that it would saturate after some time? Like, what, what, what was the reason for that change? Ah, uh, well, yeah, so we could, call it, we could call it minimum depth or something like that, uh -huh. so it would still saturate. Uh -huh. But the basic issue, which I'll describe in a, in a little bit, is that this does not display a switchback effect in a nice way, uh -huh. whereas this does, and most subsequent proposals do. And uh -huh. the switchback effect was one of the first and very important pieces of evidence uh -huh. in uh -huh. favor of this. So that's why th this is Susskind Stanford here, and that's why this was kind of the first um, it's, this is also like you need to choose what, what length you're talking about, et cetera, and this is like a little bit better, a little bit less ambiguous or a little bit less number of choices uh -huh. involved in this. Oh, I see, because here you can say maximal volume, where there you, were, you had to pick a you slice. Pick a, yeah, yeah, you have to pick a, a slice uh -huh. or pick a curve somehow. And I see, thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, what's the gate set that you're using here? <laughs> Undefined. OK. Uh, and is there any idea of how this statement maps into the, the boundary? Like, let's say I restrict to let local operations in the, in the bulk. Uh, is there some uh, precise thing that this is telling you at boundary state complexity? Um, is yeah, there I mean. There? It's a great question, and it's one of the central questions of the field, which is still essentially unanswered. And it's a statement of like, you, you're making a very precise statement here. You know, like you, it has a right-hand side, which is just a number you can calculate. And there's pies and twos, and you know, where was that in what we talked about previously, which was just discrete integers, counting gates, so yeah, people have spent a large amount of effort trying to understand if there's some particularly natural notion of complexity here. For example, maybe you say I have a Hamiltonian and I will consider a gate set which allows me to do any time space independent combination of those terms in my Hamiltonian. So I can take my T00, my stress tensor, and maybe any relevant operators I have in the theory and I can turn them on in a space independent way and that would be my set of gates, right? And maybe that's a particularly natural set, which is sort of adapted to this problem. Um, and that's what I try to motivate with this comment that since you're kind of embedding the UV into the infrared, you might hope dynamics here is relatively universal. Like it sort of is characteristic of the theory itself and not of the way you define it microscopically. But there's, I would say no real clear, I mean, no complete proposal where we know like that these are the gates and it's equal to this. So if you look in the literature, people just talked about the number of elements of a minimal tensor network that prepares the state or a minimal circuit that prepares the state. And it was understood that, you know, maybe you could hope to match these things, but that was a more fine-grained question that we didn't know the answer to at this time. Okay, thank you. So I'm still a little bit bothered by uh, like the lack of a choice of gate set is, or like how this can be uh, a proposal without <laughs> that. Because <laughs> it seems like it has achieved that status, but it I guess has. now I don't know what it's, what it's saying. Um, is the idea that there exists some gate set for which this is true or we just have no idea? I think the most optimistic view is, is which is a view that I'm pretty re willing to believe, is that there is some microscopic definition for which this is more or less the right answer, like it's literally equal. But we don't necessarily know what that definition is. And at this stage, you know, as from, what I, from what I've said here, what you could say is that, let's say, no matter what gate set you choose, you would have this linear growth with time. Mm -hmm. That's sort of independent of the precise gate set. Of course, the coefficient in front matters. But well, we could say it always scales with volume. But it, yeah, it would sort of grow with the interior in some characteristic yeah. way. Right. Okay.
Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, did you say there was a question? Okay, speak up if you still want to. Guess not. Brian, I'm, all, I'm still a bit puzzled by your... So, so in, the, in the circuit story you told us last time, you know, there, there were these layers of, of gates and, and, and one layer, as I understood, was, per, was for one instant of time. So, so you, but now the layers are sort of in the spatial directions yeah. so, so so in as in general relativity of course you don't care that it, the coordinate is called t and is a time <laughs> outside right. it's just you know that you maybe i mean why, i'm i'm confused about this sort of um, in the holographic picture the one that you unfortunately just erased uh, yeah right the, 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 the layers were going in the spatial direction yeah let me draw it again so it's sort of like I think about it like this. You could think of two different sort of, um, like let's suppose we're at this time. The standard picture would be like a sort of boundary picture is that you take the state here and then you evolve it like this way, right? So that would look like sort of bell pairs and then you apply some unitary transformation to the two sides, right? right? But then there's this sort of other way of looking at it where you go to this other slice here and that's sort of like moving these things down, like pushing them in this diagram. It doesn't really matter where I put the circuit, I could put it inside. And so now I'm having kind of the standard reference state outside or the like reference configuration here and I'm storing my list of effective gates kind of along the wormhole like that. Uh, this question might be a bit uh, left field, but is there an algebraic notion of complexity? Like, do I have to reference the set of gates or, because it seems like if you did this in gravity, I would just have like some set of operators I want to compute something. Uh, is there any notion of that or do I have to make reference to like the state and all this stuff. Well, I, I would encourage you to do what you like. In particular, if you have another I want to do this, why I'm asking you. If you have another proposal for what this is, you can write a paper and get 100 citations. It's, it's straightforward to achieve. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really like, you know, let, let me just like, there's, there, there's a large number of proposals. So there's, there's, there's the original CV, there's something called CA, which I was involved with, which says that instead of volume, we should do action. Um, there's C space time volume. Um, there's C anything. I mean, that's literally a paper saying that anything does this. Basically, you take these surfaces and you integrate some scalar function along them, right? then minimize that, that will also, or maximize that, that will also grow, and with a different coefficient, right? So, and then, you know, people talked about, well, let me not get into this, but, you know, there's also unitary versus non-unitary. That is, do we allow the gates to include, say, non-unitary elements? We talked about Euclidean path integrals this morning. That's, so maybe we should also, if we're thinking about preparing states with Euclidean path integrals, maybe we should allow non-unitary elements as well as unitary elements. Of course, that's certainly something you can do. You can always implement non-unitary elements. You just can't do it deterministically on a quantum computer, but it's still possible. So there's a, like, a large number of bulk proposals and similarly a large number of boundary proposals, and we just don't know how they, how they hook up. Um, so... I, I, I think at this point it might be helpful, sorry, but now you're telling us that we know neither what the left-hand side nor the right-hand side is, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that they're probably equal. Yes. <laughs> there must be a more compelling argument. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, I, why are there 100 citations for every paper? There's probably a reason, right? Yeah, there, there is, which I'll, yeah, which I'll come to. But there was one question. Um, so I actually just wanted to ask or remark, like, should we, like, shouldn't we actually not really need to be concerned about like what set of gates we work with because it seems like to me that that would just add like some constant factor to the complexity depending you know like depending on whatever set of gates you work with you would just have like a some kind of constant factor and maybe that's the only difference between like maybe an equation like this whole with any universal set of gates it's just like the constants different Indeed, indeed. I think that's a very healthy perspective and it's basically saying that yes there are lots of things that grow but of course we expect that. You can use any gate set and the complexity with that gate set would grow linear with time. You, and so it, of course there should be lots of things in the bulk that give you the same sort of behavior for complexity, but which differ by say constants or in the precise way that they're defined. So it's actually not unexpected. You would be surprised if there just was one thing that grew and nothing else because that is totally unable to match the variety of complexity we have on the boundary. Yeah. Um, so I take a lot of issue with that because we could just pick a gate set that's all the operators and the complexity is one, right? We just pick the correct unitary that'll take us to the state. So sure. I'm wondering, like, we need to impose some restrictions yeah, that's reasonable, yeah, like course, locality, for example. Yeah, so, I, of course I restrict to, like, local, like, few body operations. Right, okay. Um, like, uh, you know, let me say, like, so, so I won't have time to cover this in detail, but there is, for example, this uh, Nielsen notion of complexity geometry, which basically says we take our generators, our Hermitian generators, and we allow some arbitrary time-dependent coefficients of those things, and that would generate us some trajectory in the unitary space. Now, my personal guess is that something like that where we define the geomet where we define the allowed generators from the structure of the theory itself, like we use the operators that survive into the infrared, that something like that probably is equal in some fairly precise sense to one of these quantities. But again, like if you use a different gate set, it won't actually change the answer that much because you can simulate any set within the other universal set. So this ambiguity, which bothered people so much at first, is something that those of us in the field have a little bit come to terms with or come to, come to peace with because you expect that, that ambiguity when talking about complexity. Um, so yeah. y yesterday, was my, if I remember correctly, it was mentioned that uh, uh, in some sense, complexity is highly not unique in the sense that uh, there's many ways you can get to a state in yep. terms of gates. Is there some uh, way of understanding this? Understanding this in the, from the perspective of the bulk, this non-uniqueness. Well, I would say it's it's one way is this like this simplexity equals anything okay. thing where you know the maximum volumes. Like, okay, suppose I'm let, let's simulate something. Suppose I'm Lenny Susskind, then I tell you maximum volume slice is the best slice. I'm a very authoritative, charismatic person, <laughs> and you just yeah, you know that's a pretty important slice. I agree. <laughs> But then someone comes along later and says, well, I mean, it's not that special. Maybe, maybe you say, well, what's really special? Not one slice, but the Wheeler DeWitt patch, which includes all the slices. And what should we do with that? We should integrate the action over it, because that's what actions do. You integrate them over space time. And lo and behold, we write this nice paper where we show that this does a much better job of accounting for what we expect complexity to do in more complicated kind of situations. Right, But, you know, you can still keep saying, well, maybe action's not that special, why this particular action, you know, et cetera. And you realize that there's just a very large number of quantities that all have the same basic structure. Mm -hmm. Thank but, you. But yes, why do we think this? Let me just give you some evidence in this favor of this. Why did people take this seriously? Why do I take it seriously? Um, evidence one is we can compute the complexity of the ground state, the complexity of the thermofield double state, and these actually match roughly what we expect um, based on like circuit arguments. So for example, if you compute this quantity, you'll find it's proportional to the number of qubits times a constant. 
And that's exactly what we argued for last time, even with this scale invariant RG circuit. Right? And similarly for this, you get an answer which is basically something like preparing these bell pairs plus the complexity of embedding them into the UV Hilbert space. And so it again sort of roughly makes sense, right? This matches expectations. You get the complexity of the time evolved state. Goes like the temperature times the entropy times time. And that's exactly what you would expect if you had order s degrees of freedom interacting or computing at a rate set by this fundamental time scale in the theory, t. Right, so if you had a bunch of qubits and each of those qubits interact with each other every one over temperature seconds, then you would expect the number of gates to be exactly or proportional to the number of qubits times essentially the time that's elapsed in units of the basic time scale, right? So rather remarkably, that comes out immediately. If you just use this procedure here, you get exactly that answer out for the growth of complexity. One of the virtues of this complexity action situation, which I was involved with, is that now if you add like charge to the black hole, for example, then this volume doesn't work as well. It doesn't reproduce this formula as nicely, but the action still works really well and gives you the same kind of structure. So this is also what we expect and seems quite reasonable. There's ambiguities. Uh, Brian? Yes. So at first I was, I was thinking that you were trying to argue that these different choices you have for one side of the equality are supposed to ultimately turn out to match uh, the ambiguities we have on the other side in terms of the gate set. Uh, but that, so this would be an example where that's not true, right? So you were saying in the, in the case of volume versus action, one just seems objectively better than the other, which would never be true when you talk about gate sets. Yeah, that's true. Um, I won't, yeah, let me not claim that, like I think volume clearly can't be the universal answer because it's not theory dependent. Like it, it, it can't just be that for every theory the volume is the right thing. We should put some theory dependence in because the theory should tell us, you know, different theories will have different complexity rates for different fixed gate sets, right? So I would say, yeah, volume is maybe too specific or can only be the answer in one specific case. So something like complexity equals action is at least encoding the physics of the theory in some way into your calculation, right? I'm using the actual action of the theory. Why couldn't that just come out of the dictionary? So if I have two different theories, if I have two different theories on the boundary, yeah. I mean, naively, why couldn't the volume have always been dual to the? Well, I mean, I, I can't prove it's not the case, but that would be surprising, I would think. Uh -huh. Like for every possible theory that it's the volume, and I, and I think we sort of know from these examples with charge or other kind of examples that it just can't be the case. What I don't understand is why the bulk volume is supposed to have that much less information about the boundary theory than the bulk action. Well, I just mean that the action depends on the, the, the theory explicitly. It depends on the bulk theory explicitly. Right. But I thought we're worrying about the complexity of the boundary theory. Well, I mean, but they're, I mean, they're, they're dual, so. I just mean it should know about like what are the operators in the theory, which is of course what the bulk action tells you. It tells you the fields, it tells you how they interact. So you would expect that data to be a part of the definition on the boundary. Yeah. I don't remember, but yeah, I'm not sure. I don't Could remember. Could you repeat the question? I, I was just asking whether the, so, so Brian said that the volume gave the wrong, action, wrong answer for charged black holes. I was asking whether the space-time volume did as well. Yeah, I remember we thought about the space-time volume at the time, but I don't remember what we concluded. So let me just say I'm not, I don't remember. Couldn't you have made the same comment about theory dependence about Ryu Takanagi? Sorry, the dependence about what? The th sorry. The theory dependence of the bulk. Couldn't you, couldn't you have said the same thing about Ryu Takanagi? 
because the area doesn't know about the bump theory? Well, it is theory dependent. I mean, we use this answer like it's the right answer, but it's only the right answer for theories of the Einstein dual. So it is theory dependent. It just, okay. in the same way that volume roughly captures the behavior that we care about, so does the RT formula. But of course, it depends on the theory. Okay, so, so we have these explicit calculations that roughly match what we expect from circuits. We have ambiguities people spent a lot of time thinking about, which sort of also, let me just say, roughly, roughly match. For example, um, Shira Chapman, Rob Myers, many people looked at the way that these quantities diverge near the boundary and tried to match those divergences to divergences you would get from definitions of complexity and field theory. And they could achieve some matching, right? So this is a very non-trivial thing that turns out to work. Another extremely important test, which modern proposals all pass, is the switchback effect. Um, that looks like the following. Suppose I considered some forward time evolution U of T. I put a perturbation W and then I evolved backwards in time again. This is the Heisenberg operator. So if W wasn't there, then the forward and backward evolution would cancel. But if W is there, there's a partial cancellation. Eventually, once you evolve long enough, this perturbation spreads over the whole system, and now you have the full complexity growth. But at early times, there's a partial cancellation between the forward circuit and the backward circuit. If, for example, you think of them as a brickwork, like we described last time, you think of them like this, as composed of little pieces, and you put the perturbation, let me draw the perturbation in red. If you put the perturbation here, you can see that the gate here and the gate here will cancel initially with their corresponding partners in the inverse, right? But eventually, this perturbation will spread and stop that cancellation. So the complexity of this whole object, you might naively think, is two times the time, times this rate. But actually, there's a reduction because some of the gates cancel. And you can actually precisely estimate how big that reduction should be, both from the internal dynamics within the matrix degrees of freedom and also from the spatial dynamics, which involves how fast things spread in space. And remarkably, this formula, the volume, the action, and others, they reproduce this reduction. So the geometry itself knows about this, and these formulas give you that reduction in the complexity, just as you would expect from this picture. So I would say if you really think, like, there's some unknown but probably existing definition of microscopic complexity with some set of gates or some choice, it looks like these quantities collectively do a very good job of reproducing all of your basic expectations about what that should be. They give you roughly the right complexity for the ground state, for thermofield double states, roughly the right complexity growth in simple CFTs. They can reproduce the variation with charge and other degrees of freedom. They have ambiguities that roughly match on the two sides and they reproduce this switchback effect. Okay, yeah. Um, what does this switchback effect look like in the bulk? Well, so this, the question was, what, what does the switchback effect look like in the bulk? Well, this is, this operator is equivalent to what's called a shock wave. Basically, you evolve backwards in time, you send in some pulse, and then you go forward again. And, um, this shock wave can be modeled in simple terms as a null energy that goes into the bulk, and you can solve Einstein equation in the presence of that null energy, and you get some different geometry, where as you pass through that, your coordinates get shifted in some specific way, right? There's a gluing procedure where you glue different of these black holes together. And um, that gluing procedure gives you these nice geometries, which encode 
basically the scrambling physics that underlies the switchback effect, and that's how you see it in the bulk. Yeah, there's a question behind you. So if I'm understanding correctly, this growth with time, right, that you're pointing out in the second property, was something that you uh, pointed out last time, yeah, the other, yesterday, rega with regard to the complexity that depended on the parameter epsilon, yes. right? So in this situation, this would be, so in which we measure the complexity of a state as with respect to one that is arbitrarily close to it, or, well, depending on the parameter epsilon. So in this case, these are states that live in the boundary, right? Would you have some sort of uh, similar thing for what you find in the bulk? Could you? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there should be potentially some tolerance in the bulk as well. We also don't know very well how to define or characterize that. On the other hand, if you take one of these more continuous notions of complexity, like where I allow arbitrarily space-independent sources, say, then it's easier to come to exactly reproduce certain states. Hmm. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the ambiguity should be there, but it's possible that it's sort of not very visible within the vagaries of large N and other things we've neglected in this calculation. Okay. So like, you know, very often what will happen is that there is some small tolerance you need, but maybe it's like not visible at the leading order at large n or something like that. Okay, thank you. So I just want to point out two additional things about this. Um, this is a, an, an incomplete list, but among other things, there really is evidence that it's minimal in some sense. Like this switchback effect is evidence for minimality. Because there is a naive circuit which does this, which is to use the full time evolution backwards apply the operator and use the full-time evolution forwards. But the geometry does not give you that answer. It gives you this reduced answer where you have the cancellations that you can make between the forward and the backwards. Similarly, if you look at this time evolved formula here, it's proportional to the entropy, not the total number of UV degrees of freedom. And you might intuitively think that if I am indeed evolving a low energy state in some microscopic theory, the complexity shouldn't be time dependent by an amount proportional to the UV, it should just know about the infrared, right? So this is actually suggesting that whereas the algorithm I alluded to last time would have a complexity cost which is proportional to the one norm of the Hamiltonian, which is some UV divergent thing that doesn't really make sense in the infrared, here it's sort of suggesting that there is actually an effective way to evolve the state using only a sort of infrared finite amount of quantum gates. And so again, that, that that seems to suggest that it's, not, it's knowing that you shouldn't do this sort of full UV evolution, you should actually do the evolution on these active infrared degrees of freedom, and that's a more efficient circuit. Okay. So let me just, you know, say, you know, ideas for, for the boundary definition. Definitions, plural. Um, so people have talked about field theory complexity, especially in the context of free theories. So rather than formulating things in terms of qubits, you think in terms of boson and fermion creation and annihilation operators, and you have a series of gates built out of polynomials of those operations. And at, at the end of the lecture, I'll distribute a sheet with a bunch of references on it, so you can not worry about trying to figure out what exactly I'm talking about here. Um, field theory complexity, so like bosons and fermions. And you can use this Nielsen metric, Nielsen approach, and that gives you a very nice description where you can actually calculate these things for free theories and sort of speculate about how it would look for interacting theories. And I think this is a very promising direction. Um, it's difficult to deal with interactions explicitly, but it seems, uh, it seems very nice. There's also 
a lot of talk about path integral optimization. This is one of the reasons why this question about whether the gates you allow are unitary or also non-unitary is important. Because from this point of view, from this path integral optimization, you're talking about Euclidean path integrals, which are essentially non-unitary evolution of some sort. And the fact that you can seem to reproduce some of these interesting features from this point of view, where you're explicitly optimizing something, right? You're explicitly saying, let me consider a family of evolutions and choose the one with some minimum value of some notion of complexity. So you really are trying hard, very courageously, to match the minimization that's going on supposedly over here. And these also lead to a very interesting set of, of results, and it's an ongoing and active uh, topic. Of course, we can talk about, you know, gate sets, maybe adapted um, to particular systems. And there's lots of other, lots of other things you can think about, right? Okay. So I think in particular these two, you know, there's a lot more to say there and it seems plausible to me that you could find some formulation of this where it really is mapping to some geometrical quantity in the bulk and maybe you could even, I don't know if prove it is the right word, but heuristically argue for the connection. Okay. So where can we go from here? Well, one interesting thing, which is actually a prediction of this, that the wormhole growth should eventually stop. Because complexity saturates eventually a very long time in a finite, finite dimensional system, as we proved last time for one definition. And so you would actually expect eventually that the growth of the interior has to cease. It's going to cease at a very long time, order e to the s time, but, but, but that's a prediction. And remarkably, this has been seen in uh, JT gravity, where they have enough non-perturbative control over the length of the wormhole to actually argue that there is a saturation. Right. And I'll give you the reference for this in the, in the, um, in the sheet that I'll hand out. So that was a very non-trivial thing that actually was remarkable, I mean, rather remarkably seen in this explicit calculation, right? So that, I, to me, is like a very strong indication that all these ideas were on the wrong, on, on the right track, because that's, you know, I think you could really essentially put it in this category of evidence that this is a reasonable proposal, because now you're seeing that some very non-trivial late time prediction of this connection is actually being borne out. Uh, so, is it all fully classical in the bulk? Sorry, is what fully classical? Uh, everything that's been argued here, is, is the bulk classical gravity? Yeah, well, what I said so far, I was just computing volumes of, of a space-time. My concern is with an... But not this, not this. Yeah, so my concern is with an evaporating black hole. Uh, once it's evaporated, what do we say about the volume of the interior or anything like that? Um, that is a good and interesting research question, which I think some people are working on, so let me not say too much about it. <laughs> okay. But, um, yeah, that's a question that, that, you can, that you can ask about. And it's a good question. Okay.
Okay. Um, another direction that people are thinking a lot about now in this holographic context are what goes by the name of pythons, Python lunches. This is something that Jeff worked on, along with Lenny and others. And this is the idea that there can be geometrical obstructions to decoding, for example, of the black hole in this evaporating context. And these geometrical obstructions come from essentially are the geometrical version of non-unitary elements in a circuit. So they indicate, for example, that you post-selected some qubits, you required some qubits to be placed into a definite state at the end of the calculation. And you can always achieve that by doing the circuit a bunch of times and measuring, for example. But that will typically take a certain number of steps to achieve because you can't get the dirt, a certain outcome with definite probability. Now, of course, you can, there are ways to speed this up. Maybe just naively measuring is not the best strategy. There's something called amplitude amplification and Grover's search, which does a better job. But the, but the basic intuition that if you have, say, a tensor network which in, or a circuit that involves post-selection, you need to do a lot of work to reproduce that. And so this has further complicated this question of what is complexity this has led to the idea of what's sometimes called restricted versus unrestricted complexity, which is about characterizing what you're allowed to do on the state. Can you act, say, on both sides of the system simultaneously, or can you only act on one side, et cetera? So that's an interesting thing. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this next time. Um, another sort of output is that you have robust, specifically linear growth of complexity. So for example, if you take the bulk and you add stringy corrections, or you send in lots of shock waves, or you do whatever you like, the interior keeps growing, the rate of growth may be different, but this seems like a quite robust output, and so you might hope then that you should be able to go into quantum many body physics generally, forget about gravity, and say just for some very large class of systems, maybe what people normally call quantum chaotic Hamiltonians, you should be able to just prove that the complexity grows linearly. And that's not crazy. We know other things that grow linearly for a long time, like the spectral form factor. So you might hope that there's a theorem floating around out there in space we haven't found yet, which says, if you have a K local Hamiltonian and the form factor grows linearly for arbitrarily a long time with some smearing procedure, you know, then the complexity must also grow in some way. We don't have that yet, but in some ways we're actually kind of close to that. But what's remarkable is that this, this hypothesis of linear growth specifically has triggered a lot of activity in the quantum formation community because they also have related conjectures that certain kinds of complexity grow rapidly with time. But so far, they have not managed to sort of fully prove those conjectures in the level of generality that they would like. Right, so actually next time we're going to talk about proving this growth for what are called random circuits. And let me give you a sense of what that is. Brain, I have a couple yeah. of questions. Sure. So One is if, um, so in all this discussion, it seems like having an interior is very relevant. 
Yeah. So because all this growth in volume or action is related to, to the growth of the interior. So what about complexity for states that are not the vacuum state but not black hole states? Oh, you can think about that too, yeah. And in that case, what, like, uh, don't expand maybe the volume to say it's thermal, the uh, EDS with some thermal gas. Then should I consider, what would that complexity be dual to? Because in that case, probably the volume doesn't particularly grow with time or. Right, right, yeah. So I guess you're, you're sort of, if I understand your question correctly, you're, I would say you're hinting at two different things. So one is I could just consider other kinds of geometrical states. Like, for example, I could turn on charge and consider some kind of ground state where I have a long throat that's terminated in some star or something like that, right? And I could ask, like, what's the complexity of that and does that match my expectation for, for the field theory side? And people have looked at things like this and to the extent that we understand or have a good guess for what the complexity should be, it does roughly match in the cases that I know. If you're talking about what the extra complexity do to bulk degrees of freedom, that's a relatively unexplored topic, I would say. Um, to leading order, it, it, it's, in, it's an interesting topic. So for example, to leading order and large n, the bulk degrees of freedom are often free fields in the examples we understand. So you wouldn't expect their sort of bulk effective complexity to ever be very high because free fields never have a very high complexity. So from that point of view, there's not very many of them and their complexity can't be very high just naively, like locally, maybe if you have a lot of degrees of freedom or you integrate them in some other way. Um, but yeah, I think it's not very well explored how like the bulk degrees of freedom would contribute to this story. But you know, you, you can, uh, I don't know if anyone's written this time in print, but you could cook up, you know, some reasonable definition, like take the action of the weird wit patch and the complexity of the bulk state inside that patch and that's the complexity of the full thing. I don't know if that's true or not, but, but it's a reasonable guess. So that's a direction that you could think about if you wanted. The other question was about, uh, on very long times, I know that complexity has some recurrence time. Yeah. So is the idea that that's not captured by this because it would be on time so long that it's beyond the evaporation of black hole and so you m could have some quantum gravity effect that kicks in and so you cannot describe it semi-classically or, or can you predict the recurrence of complexity. In the yeah, I mean, you're, you're very ambitious. Um, we've just, like a year ago, seen the plateau of it. And now we want to go to doubly exponentially long time to see the recurrence of it. So, yeah, I mean, it would be nice to see. I don't know how to think about it, but, but yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to see. But it's a non perturbative effect. It's a very non perturbative effect. Like, very, very non perturbative. But let me put that here. This very long time physics. There was a paper um, by Nick Hunter Jones and some of the Hordetskys in which they actually proved some very nice results about the very long time physics of complexity and how long it should have to have recurrences and so forth. And so, like, that overlaps with this growing of the, see, seeing the, gro the growth of the wormhole stop. But seeing other aspects of that very long time physics is very interesting. And there's puzzles there. So, for example, you can ask about the variance of the length of the wormhole. And, you, you know, it's not clear that matches exactly what you expect in this other setting. So there may be subtleties or additional complications in the way that we identify the wormhole length or volume or action or whatever with the complexity, right? So there's more to learn by thinking about these very late time things. Okay. Well, rather than starting on this other topic, I think it's a good time just to, to stop for the day. So thanks.